Thick clouds coming from Cape Horn slide across the Patagonian skies. Time slips away, along with the rhythm of the winds and tides. And this time is well spent by sea lions. Quite often, two of these sea lions spend their whole day together, bound by a strong friendship. Thus starts the 24-hour underwater odyssey of two sea lionesses, Roxy the Intrepid and Kim the Wise. Middle March, the height of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Young sea lions have added to the original number already present two months ago. It is here on Peninsula Valdez where sea lions of South America come each year to perpetuate their species. Three o'clock, 25 degrees in the shade. Flippers spread apart, the sea lions sweat under their fur, waiting for the cooling sea breeze to refresh their overheated bodies. In what looks like complete disorder, a male dominates a harem of ten females. Now this male has quite a mane to his name, but Lord does it itch. To avoid risking losing his harem to another male, Mr. Easy Life just lies on the beach all day scratching himself and living off his blubber. His blubber, or fat reserves, is a haven for sand fleas. From one to another, all the females are infested with these parasites. Among them, Kim, an adult female about 20 years old, dressed in a caramel colored coat. She is wise and placid. At this instant, she devotes herself to her youngster. She gave birth to him two months ago. He was conceived the year before. While suckling, the youngster is contaminated as well. On the outskirts of the harem, the young females or adolescents doze lazily. One in particular, Roxy, with a grey face and a dark brown body, has a character of her own. Dauntless Roxy is the only one who would use a sea elephant as a private pillow. Four o'clock. Kim leaves the colony and her baby to go fishing. Even though giving birth and suckling tires her out, she must force herself to replenish her energy and prove her hunting tactics. And here is today's victim. One down. Like mother, like son. For Kim's baby, every reason is a good reason to play, no matter what object is used. Five o'clock. The tide withdraws and exposes a range of rocks covered in green algae. Roxy has left her private pillow and goes off for a swim. But it is already late and the sea is far away. Roxy is only four years old. She is young and supple.
she has all the experience she needs to caper about, but for fishing, she still has a lot to learn. She still doesn't know that her moustache or vibrissa is useful in finding food under the sand. Kim has noticed that a young intruder has trespassed into her hunting grounds. She goes to investigate. Vibrissa against Vibrissa, they identify each other. No combat occurs. In fact, just the opposite. They go off together to hunt grouper. Roxy loudly exhales all the air in her lungs to sink to the bottom. The grouper quickly searches for its hiding place. The sea lionesses hover silently. Unconscientiously, the grouper thinks the passage is clear. Kim listens. Her vibrissa can detect the slightest vibration. Kim has just felt a ripple of water coming from a couple of meters away. She goes to check it out. Roxy seems cross at being overtaken. She will have her revenge. The only problem with Grouper and Kim knows only too well is that they have dorsal, razor-sharp spines. It is difficult to know from what angle to make the attack. And now the game starts. Kim has to push away Roxy, who goes for the same prey, while finding a breach in the Grouper's defence. Kim has found the grouper's vulnerable spot, the nape of the neck. Roxy hangs in, trying to get to the prey first. She surprises Kim by arriving all of a sudden, stealing the fish and trying to break it up into small pieces. Ah, Kim is not going to let her get away with it. Finally recovering of what is of right, Kim takes her prey to the sea floor and devours it. Once again, Roxy knows that she has been defeated by the force of experience. Kim starts to enjoy her prey by eating the easier bits, starting by opening it up by the stomach. Roxy keeps her distance, preferring to go and hunt alone. The easy parts devoured, Kim finds herself battling against the leather coarse skin to eat the rest. Sea lion teeth are not used for chewing or tearing, they are used to grip their prey and prevent them from setting themselves free. Once prey is captured, the only way to tear away the skin is by throwing the body about, separating the flesh from the indigest bones. An hour later and hardly anything is left. Kim looks for new hunting ground. Day comes to an end.
Not far off the coast, Roxy frolics about in the water at sunset. She is not alone. For all the youngsters, sunset means playtime. Whilst playing, they educate their bodies into playing vital games which will be used when they are adults, such as aggressiveness, submission and seduction. The School of Waves teaches them new games and new pleasures. and Kim's hungry baby waits anxiously for his mother. Kim has reached the colony but lingers in the water, playing about with the colourful titbits in the sand. When a powerful muzzle saves its way through the sand, no mollusk can use the protection of algae to hide away. The only way to become invisible is to camouflage their bodies. At the seashore, all the babies await their mother's return. There are two ways in distinguishing their baby from the rest of the bunch. Their scent and cry, which since the first hours of life have united them to their mothers. Kim comes to her hungry and impatient youngster. Patience is a virtue, and he must wait just a little longer. She will only let him suckle further up the beach. It is eight o'clock, and the sea tides are rising. The mother's milk is very rich. It's unctuous, it's poor in sugars, but highly concentrated with fats. At each suckling, the young sea lion swallows between three to four litres, an athlete's diet. But for now, the sea is coming in. High tide, and back to Roxy. She's wet. Her dark brown coat has turned into a silky grey. She is back with an unexpected prey, a dog shark, and still alive. It's very rare to see a sea lion catch this small but vicious shark. Kim, further up the beach, recognises Roxy's good catch and salutes her arrival. After breakfast, when the sea has risen, it's time for everyone to go for a swim. One of the first to arrive at the water's edge is Kim's baby. The youngsters venture out to discover a new world. By the age of two months, they already know how to swim, but are completely oblivious to danger that surrounds them. Kim's little baby, like the others, has no idea that a potential killer can surge from a wave at any instant. The killer whale, enemy number one of the sea lions. Superb predator, up to nine meters in length, more than six tons of pure muscle and slyness. This one is Mel, a solitary hunter, about 20 years old. To launch his attacks, he awaits the rise in the tides, the moment when most of the youngsters are playing in the shallow waters.
giant petrels and other scavengers are always around to pick up the rests. One young sea lion is not enough to satiate Mel's appetite. He hovers in front of the whole colony to block access to the sea. For Roxy and her companions, this is another opportunity to play another game, attracting Mel's attention if they want to go out to sea. Killer whales are intelligent hunters. They hold their breath underwater and listen for the splash of young sea lions at the water's edge. The only way to detect a killer whale in the water is by seeing its dorsal fin which reaches a height of about six feet. To add to his perfection in the attack, the killer whale also hunts through echolocation. Now this works like a sonar and can detect prey in the most obscure of waters. Roxy is a little unsure about the whole situation. She decides to go for a swim later on. But many youngsters still play in the water, unfortunately. The second attack is a success, once again. Mel has had enough for today. Today, two mothers have lost their babies, one of them being Kim. With no more attachments left with this colony, she leaves in search of a more secure colony. The male seems surprised, but one female leaving is of no importance. He has other females to think about. Roxy doesn't want Kim, her partner in hunting, to leave. Kim still has much to teach her. One o'clock, a colony is sighted. It looks safe enough, but she must get there first. Roxy, with all her young energy, is the first to try and climb. Kim, not feeling so energetic, looks for a smoother climb. Whilst Roxy continues trying to escalate the cliff, Kim has swum all the way around the colony to find easy access. In vain. She must wait for the next full tide to reach the colony. High tide will be late at night. For this long wait, Kim proposes to go off in search of new hunting grounds. Direction, open sea. On the way, they meet with extraordinary mammals, 
dusky dolphins. Like killer whales, they also detect objects through a biological sonar system. An object as big as a sea lion is quickly noticed. Swimming past them with incredible speed, the six feet long dolphins outnumber the sea lions. The dolphins mean no harm. They don't attack the sea lions as prey or as potential hunting enemies. Kim finds, floating in the water, the rests of a meal. Scales of fish. There is no doubt that dolphins are the cause, but there is no fish in view, which is strange. Another pod of dolphins come and join the original group. Roxy goes off to meet them. She seems to enjoy playing around with these living torpedoes. joins her. An intruder comes to their meeting, distinctively a common dolphin recognized by its long snout. He obviously lost himself or lost track of his original pod and comes to join this pod who see no inconvenience in adopting orphans. The pod is now all present. The leader sets off the signal, ordering everyone to plunge into the depths. The sea lions at the surface seem surprised at the abrupt departure of the dolphins. The dolphins have gone to eat a hundred meters below and their favorite menu shows face, an enormous school of anchovies. Dolphins have a unique way of devouring these small fish. They round them up into a tightly packed school and push them to the surface of the water. When ready, all they have to do is head first into this ball of food. Seabirds have found their meal too. The meal starts for everyone, or almost. Kim and Roxy are perplexed. They waited for the dolphins to come back to the surface, but they didn't arrive at the same place they were before. In the meantime, the dolphins are letting bubbles of air into the water to panic the fish, and then they launch their ferocious attack from all angles. The underwater and aerial excitement has attracted all sorts of other scavengers. Last arrival, Kim, faced with a much smaller quantity of fish. The two sea lionesses, thanks to the seagulls, realize that the dusky dolphins have found another school of anchovies, and this time a larger one. Dolphins share their food graciously. They leave the massive school of panicked fish to the two sea lionesses. 
It's time for a binge. There is no comparing a dolphin strategy. Here is Kim and Roxy. Individualists, opportunists, aggressive. Friendship ends when food is in sight. But as soon as the reason for their rivalry disappears, their feelings to one another vanish just as quickly. They're once again friends. Until the next banquet. <laughs>